All right. So presentation, it kind of builds off uh, Joanna's and it's the detection of fetal malformations. Um, so this is more like specific application of OB ultrasound. Okay, so just kind of like a brief overview. The ultrasound can be kept up in, in the um, uterus. This can include um, organs, mineral obstructions, state of fatida, abnormal limb development, polydactyly, polydactyly um, left palate. Basically, um, any of the regions that you could uh, ultrasound in a normal human, you can also um, ultrasound in a fetus. Um, the only issue is sometimes the orientation of, of the fetus in the womb um, can obstruct certain views, um, but that's going to depend on case by case. So we're just going to kind of go through that more quickly, then through that. Um, so this is just some more information generally over ultrasound. Um, this was already kind of discussed, but one of the major applications is the crown uh, rump length. And this is commonly used to um, pinpoint um, exactly how old the um, fetus is and um, get a good time uh, like of expected birth. Um, and some limitations, limitations though, uh, especially for uh, diagnosing um, fetal issues have to do with either whether the disease um, like manifests too late in a term so that the window between an opportunity to ultrasound and birth is too small, or if the um, issues can be resolved in utero. So some defects can kind of present themselves, but then resolve before birth. So that can make diagnose um, kind of like there can be an issue because you can get like a false positive. Um, and then some other like just kind of broad applications for this um, ultrasound is becoming particularly useful in diagnosing uh, trisomies 13, 18, and 21 because of the distinctive facial features. And these typically become um, more apparent around the 21st week. And so they, Diagnosis can be accompanied by like fetal blood, um, uh, fetal DNA in the mother's blood. And these two together can provide a fairly accurate diagnosis um, very early on of trisomies 13, 18, 20. They're not um, invasive, so there's no danger to the fetus. So that was just kind of a brief kind of introduction into the fetal ultrasound. Um, so in some of his applications, I'm going to look into now three um, very specific kind of fetal um, malformations. And for each of these, I'm also going to look into a specific case study just to kind of illustrate how ultrasound is integrated into medical practice, uh, along with other diagnostic practices and procedures and how that can influence the outcome of the treatment of the patient. And so we're gonna go over briefly. So a crania is what you can see here. That is gonna be where you have an absence of the cranium. So the kind of like the cap of the skull. Um, there's gonna be no development there. So the brain tissue will be completely exposed. Uh, then in the middle, we have a copy of cordis and that's gonna be when you have either a complete or a partial protrusion of the heart through a defect in the thoracoabdominal uh, wall. And then in cephalocele, that's gonna be when the neural tube doesn't completely close and you have a protrusion of brain matter through a like fusion of the, like a failure of the bone to fuse through a joint. Um, and so with, in regards to these three, it's very important to diagnose because it's gonna have a significant impact on how the patient is treated. For cephalocele, it depends on where 
the like herniation of the brain actually occurs, but that location can significantly um, influence like the success rate of surgery. And so that's important to inform the parents of the uh, differences in success rates um, in determining if they wanna either terminate the pregnancy or not. In ectopia cordis, these also, the success rate isn't super high, but intervention through surgery can at least give the baby a chance. And then acrania is useful in diagnosis because um, while acrania is generally lethal, um, it can be differentiated from other diseases or malformations that um, could potentially you know, not be as lethal and be safe. So early identification is really important. Um, for diagnosis of the patient, you know, to help the parents make a, an informed decision. So now we're going to look at a crania in a bit more detail. And this is just kind of a reference slide. So the image on the left is a normal fetus. You can see the hypercode line around where the skull would be, and that is what is expected. And then on the right, you can see um, kind of where the two top arrows are pointing the brain matter, and there's no really strong hypercope line there. And so there's no skull basically holding the brain matter in place, and it's just freely floating in the amniotic fluid. Um, so now a little bit more specifics on acrania. It's about one in a thousand. It's a rare disease, but it's common enough that it can be seen, especially in OB. Um, diagnosis typically occurs around 12 weeks, and that's just because the, um, the skull, the crystallization doesn't, or calcification doesn't actually occur until about 12 weeks, so you can't tell if there's an absence until that's occurred. Um, this is like kind of hypothesized to be due to an issue in mesenchymal migration around the fourth week um, of gestation. And um, so you can see in the top image, just again, an example of where there's a complete lack of skull. And um, the bottom is gonna show an actual ultrasound image taken of it and you can see the, um, you know, the brain structures, the asterisk indicates the interior hemispheric fissure. You can see some of the, um, the brain and out of there, which you typically should not be able to see. So the actual visualization of it is pretty much the biggest indicator for a diagnosis. Um, and so now I'm just gonna kind of walk you through a case of a cranium. And it's specifically for the patient on the top image. And so what these um, physicians noted, um, they immediately saw the brain, um, the interhemispheric uh, fissures and salusti. And they also noted that the brain is easily compressible, which typically shouldn't happen if the skull was surrounding it because it could provide like a protective barrier. And so they were like, like, that gave them a very strong um, like idea that, you know, they were dealing with acrania. Some of the other factors that they noted, because sometimes acrania can be accompanied by other malformations or diseases. But in this case, they really didn't notice anything. They noted that there was a slight increase in amniotic fluid. Um, they also noted that there was a normal vascular pattern, which is also characteristic of acrania, and you can see. And they also noted normal cardiac activity, normal facial features. The placenta was normal. Um, both orbits were normal and they were symmetrical. Um, the spine appeared normal morphology. They had normal bone development. Um, the intestines, the gallbladder, kidneys, that all appeared fine. Um, however, um, they did advise abortion just for the mother's safety, and they ended up going through with the abortion. Um, and then after they uh, removed the fetus, they were able to confirm that it was a crania. Um, so going on to this next slide, you can see here 
is kind of the color Doppler M mode that they took of the brain. And this was just to confirm neural vasculature in the brain. And this is um, used to differentiate from other um, diseases because in Ukraine, the brain itself develops completely normal, but it's just subject to a lot of trauma because it's floating free in the amniotic fluid. And the only is just lack of development of that cranium. Um, so that was just kind of a little bit more over cranium. Now we're going to move into ectopia cordis. So ectopia cordis is a protrusion of the heart through the tracheoacromial wall, tracheoabdominal wall. Sorry, um, it's associated with multiple chromosomal abnormalities. Um, including Turner syndrome, which we've covered a little bit in lecture. And it can also be associated with uh, the pentology. A whole host of issues commonly presents itself like that. Um, typically, the earliest possible diagnosis is possible at around nine to 10 weeks. Um, however, on average, it typically occurs around the 26 week, just to be certain. Um, and oftentimes with uh, ectopia cordis, a 3D ultrasound, which I have the image A on the right, um, it's typically used just to better localize it and to give uh, a better diagnosis. Um, the specificity goes up with a 3D ultrasound. And I just thought the idea kind of of a 3D ultrasound was pretty cool. Um, yeah. Anyways, um, on this next image, they also use um, uh, color to visualize the heart because um, the heart's still, it's completely functional and it's eating. And so you'll have a lot of fluids going through it, the uh, people blood basically, or depending on the stage of the terminal. And um, so that's just another way to verify that it is actually the heart protruding versus like um, intestines or something that you would see with maybe like gastrocesis or something like that. And so it's just another kind of uh, tool that can be used to ensure diagnosis properly. And so um, we're gonna go into this kind of study here. This was actually in a Nigerian hospital and um, they did use ultrasound to initially diagnose it. And they did plan to complete surgery. However, the baby died shortly after birth. So it was sad. But so a 29 year old woman came in, had a cranial length um, and a heartbeat, and they used the Doppler, like in that last image, um, to demonstrate that it was, in fact, a heart outside. And it was actually really important important to use that in this case because the patient also had oncocele, which is a protrusion of the um, intestines through the abdominal wall. And so it was really important to use that Doppler mode in this case to differentiate between those two um, abnormalities. And baby was actually, in this case, they were actually able to diagnose um, the baby with the pentology of Cantrell and a lot these two kind of symptoms that we see here are very common. Um, there is also with the pentology of control, they have a distal sternum defect, a midline uh, supra umbilical abdominal defect. Um, they have a diaphragmatic hernia and a defect in the epithelial pericardium um, and then con congenital intracardiac defect. And this baby had four of those symptoms and they're thinking it was likely just a um, you know, kind of like a emergence of that. Um, and again, surgery, they were had everything ready for surgery, but unfortunately the baby died before that can happen. But the ultrasound was able to differentiate between that and help prep for surgery if that were to happen. Um, so now we're gonna move into encephalocell. Again, it's just a protrusion of the brain matter through the skull. And the most common is either in the frontal region uh, or in the occipital region. And um, 
typically the larger that this uh, herniation is, the worse the prognosis is for the fetus. Um, the frontal region also often contains less brain matter, and it typically has a better prognosis according to several um, studies. And the occipital region often have um, a far worse prognosis. And so using ultrasound to determine where that location is exactly can be very helpful in um, advising the parents on whether termination would be you know, better or not. And then um, if it's large enough, surgery um, is often performed. And depending on location and size, they can have a variety of symptoms, which would include um, intellectual disability, growth delays, seizures, vision impairment, ataxia, hydrocephalus, and many more things. Um, and so we'll look at a quick case study here. Um, this individual was um, appeared normal for the majority of development. Um, around 22 weeks of gestation, uh, they found this mass, which you can see on the left image, put by the Arabs, um, and it was in the frontal region of the fetus. And you can see here, it was very large, which made it very apparent with ultrasound. Sometimes the smaller ones, they have to end up using MRI. We'll discuss that in a little bit. But this one was really large. And so um, they were also able to verify that it was um, a hernia because they used that M mode again, and they found no vasculature supply within it. So that kind of helped them confirm that it was just the brain tissue itself. Um, and um, they didn't identify any other extracranial um, malformations. And so they ended up um, conducting MRI just to verify um, their diagnosis. And aminocentesis, aminocentesis was performed um, after this just to look for any um, um, karyotyping issues um, that could have been present, um, trisomies or something like that. Um, but they didn't find anything. They just found that it was a normal male. Um, however, due to the size, it was advised to terminate it, and abortion was um, conducted just because there was a very low uh, prognosis for the infant. And so, lastly, I'm just going to go over real quick the comparison of our ionophthalmia ring with regards to encephaly. Um, so, the example I gave, the herniation was very large, and so it was fairly. Um, however, with very small ones, it's often more common to use MRI for this because it can localize it uh, with a much better contrast. And surgery can often be done to correct this if the herniation is small enough. And so the increased relation is better for localization and helping this develop a plan on how to actually um, go about fixing this. But ultrasound is still a like a good first line of defense um, for this, and um, it's significantly faster and cheaper. So it's typically kind of the first thing you use to look, and then MRI can be used as kind of like a follow up and check if everything was diagnosed correctly. Um, yeah, so that was the diseases that I went over. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. For listening.